Jeremiah 18, beginning at verse 1, and we shall read through verse 6. As always, I read from the King James text. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, the sign of a craftsman. Hallelujah. Oh, have it. I told you I have it. The sign of a craftsman. Praise the Lord. Bow your heads with me one more moment, if you would. Master, we love you. We love the Word of God. We love the Spirit of God. We love your presence. We love your power. We love the salvation that you have brought into our lives today. Master, in the name of Jesus, we loose the presence and power of God in the house of God. We loose it over the airwaves. We ask God in the name of Jesus that you would touch hearts, touch minds, touch lives as the word of God goes forth today. Help us, Lord, to hear what the Spirit would say unto the church. Not merely to hear it in our hearing, but to receive it in our heart. O oh, Master, allow this word today to be good seed that falls upon good ground. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The sign of a craftsman. We often hear people making the declaration, God doesn't make junk. But many will use this phrase, listen to me now, to compensate for weakness and flaws rather than as an affirmation of his commitment to quality and perfection. While it is true God does not make junk, it is also true that the process of making a high quality product is seldom quick or without numerous steps and processes. Why then is it that so many believers seem to be in a mad hurry to arrive at their final destination? Ignoring their own flaws and imperfections and somehow believing the Lord will ship them out, so to speak, stamped, ready for market. Oh, my word, have mercy. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody wants to get where they're going. Everybody wants to be a thing. You know, it cracks me up. All these people listen to preachers on TV. Oh, you're going to get your elevation. You're going to be advanced. You're going to get your promotion. And those are the preachers people run to listen to. Those are the people, pe the uh, preachers, people send millions of dollars to support. Why? Because they're hearing what they want to hear. Nobody wants to dare tell them what the Lord said through 
the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18. And that is, I'm God, you're the clay, I'm the potter. I can make you whatever I want to make you. Got news for you, honey. The clay don't tell the potter how quickly to work. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. You say, well, sure it does, because the clay will start to dry out after a while. Well, you know what a potter does? He puts water on his hands, and he begins to apply that to that clay. And guess what? becomes flexible all over again. People want to think, no, I, I, I believe God has all this great stuff for me. I believe God wants to do all this great stuff with me and through me. And Lord, it should happen tomorrow. Tomorrow? Most people won't even wait till tomorrow. It should happen today. It should happen now. Lord, I need my promotion now. I need my elevation now. Come on now. I need my raise now. And the Lord's saying, no, I can't give you that raise yet because you still haven't learned how to handle money. I can give you all the I can give you all the money in the world. I could make you into one of the richest men in the world. And guess what? You would blow it and be broke just as fast as anybody. People win the lottery every day who don't know how to handle money. And what happens, Tommy? They go out and spend, 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 spend. Never think about the future. Never consider the expenses associated with maintaining what they're buying. I've got a young man at a restaurant in town that Tommy and I eat at fairly frequently in Applebee's. And bless his heart, he told us one day that he's shopping for a new car. He's trying to find himself a used car. And I said, is there anything in particular you're looking at? And he said, yeah. And he told me, I used to sell cars, folks. I want to tell you something. I've got some experience with cars. I know a little bit about cars. And he was talking about an Audi something or other, a used one. I said, I said, honey, you don't want that. Trust me, you don't want that. Well, why? I'll tell you why. Because if you have even the smallest problem with that car, it is going to cost you a high holy fortune to fix it. See, if you're going to buy a used car, it pays to know which vehicles are easiest and cheapest to work on. My brother Michael uh, told me he's a mechanic and a very good mechanic, I might add. And my brother told me years ago, he said one of the best vehicles you ever want that you'll ever own is a Ford F-150 pickup. I said, well, I know they're very popular. I know a lot of people like them. He said, oh, no. He said, let me tell you why. He said, because those things are of such a size that if you get it with a smaller V8 engine or a V6 engine, he said, they're easy as pie for a mechanic to get under the hood and reach what he needs to reach to do what he needs to do. He said they are one of the easiest vehicles to work on so you, it doesn't take lots and lots and lots of hours under the hood to fix things so they're cheaper to repair. He said the parts are plentiful. They're made here in the United States. There are aftermarket parts also that are made that accommodate these uh, products. He said I'm telling you that's one of the best vehicles you can own. Why is it one of the best? Because it's the cheapest when you buy it new? Nope, it's not the cheapest. Matter of fact, Ford is going to be on the higher end of the cost uh, factor when it comes to buying a new truck. But you know what? I used to work at a dealership. Somebody's going to say, Pastor, you're doing an ad for Ford. Well, I don't mean to. But I used to work at a dealership, and we sold Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, Dodge, Chrysler, and Plymouth. All six lines at the time. 
I used to be able to take a Ford truck and park it here and drive a brand new, put a Dodge truck right next to it, and I would tell my customer, now look, get under that thing, get up under it and look up and look under it, just take, you don't have to know nothing about nothing. You don't have to know anything about how cars are made. You get up under a Ford and you look up underneath it, and you get up under a Dodge, you look up underneath it, you know which one's cheaper made. You know which one doesn't have the quality, it doesn't have the attention to detail, honey, it ain't the Ford. But see, a lot of people, they want to spend money, they don't want to think about the cost of maintaining they don't want to think about the cost of repairing they don't want to contemplate and these are the people who constantly are putting themselves in a bad position and every time you turn around they're broke they're coming to work on the bus because their car is in the shop oh but they'll be the one to say lord i need more money Lord, I need you to give me a raise, Lord. I need you to give me a job that pays better, Lord. Oh, no, you don't. What you need is wisdom. What you need is an education on how to budget. What you need is to understand how to live within your means and to think past your eyeballs. Just because something looks pretty doesn't mean you can afford it. Even if the sticker on the car looks like you can afford it. No, because that sticker only tells you how much the dealer wants for it. That sticker don't tell you how much it's going to cost you to change oil in it. There are some imports, especially those Bavarian and German imports especially, folks. Those buggers, you can't even get an oil change done at the local oil change shop. you got to go to the dealership. To change the oil on one of those things will cost you $400. I could take my Lincoln that I had. I've sold it, but I had my Lincoln. I could take my Lincoln to the nearest oil change shop. They could change my oil, you know, put in that nice synthetic oil and all that. Wouldn't cost me but $100. Try that with a BMW. See how far you get. Ain't gonna happen. See how you do with a Volvo. See how you do with a sob. See how you do with a Volkswagen. I'm telling you, don't let something break down. None of those companies have a large enough share of the American automobile market to keep parts here. None of them. So you know what to do? Your car breaks something, the dealer has to call Germany. Well, hello, how can we help you? I need this part. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure, we'll send right to you. And they send it overnight because, after all, people don't want to wait weeks for their parts to come. You pay that shipping. You pay for those parts. Every part you get has to come from the manufacturer. Why? Because these companies don't have enough of the market for any of the companies who produce aftermarket parts to waste their time with it. So every time you need parts, you're going to have to get them from the factory. It's going to cost you an arm and a leg for the parts. It's going to cost you an arm and a leg for the shipping and honey. Guess how much their mechanics get? An arm and a leg. Now, most of us haven't got but one arm and one leg, and if you've been listening to me, you realize that we've just given away three arms and three legs. So you're going to be pretty broke. I tried to warn this young man and tell him, kiddo, you better think past the sticker price on the car. 
But how many Christians, Tommy, they want everything now. They want it here. And they don't understand God doesn't make junk. You got that right. God doesn't make junk. You know what that means? That means if you're going to live the life of a believer, the Word of God said, they that follow this, that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. If you're going to be led by the Spirit, <laughs> guess what? Plan on spending some time in development. God don't work fast. Half the problem the Lord has is the material that he's working with is fighting them every step of the way. No, God doesn't make junk. He makes quality. But if you're going to become what God envisions you to become, you better settle in a bit. You better learn some patience. You better learn to wait. Oh, but T.D. Jakes doesn't preach that. Rob Parsley doesn't preach that. Why, well, I know a hundred preachers on TV. Not a one of them tells me that. They all tell me, bless God, if I say in Jesus' name fast enough and enough times that I'll be like Genie and I'll be able to just beep, make it happen. It doesn't work that way. There are more believers living in debt, struggling, fighting, wrestling because they keep trying to have something they're not quite yet ready for. Oh, my word, have mercy. Oh, pastor, you don't know. You're turning off 80% of your audience. Yeah, but I'm turning on the other 20%. Hallelujah. And guess what? Those people are going to be the ones that are going to be able to go to bed and lay their head down at night and sleep and have peace. Those are the ones that aren't going to be in a constant state of panic. Those are the ones who aren't going to be in a constant state of conflict. Those are the ones who aren't going to be in a constant state of anxiety. Because when we learn to do things God's way, when we learn to let the potter have control over the clay, it'll come out good. It'll come out high quality. It'll come out something that has value. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Let me tell you, a true craftsman is never afraid of the process. He takes his time and he does things correctly rather than quickly. A craftsman will measure twice and cut once. That's a saying. Anybody knows anything about carpentry? That's a rule in carpentry and in furniture making and all anything involved in cutting wood and metal and what have you. They say measure twice, cut once. You can never measure too many times. It's always better to be safe than sorry because if you miscut it, you've just wasted material and that costs you money. Too many believers are in a fury to be. And they care not for the process which is necessary in becoming. To be what we are meant to be, we must endure the process of becoming what we are meant to become. Now, I don't know about you all, but I like to watch videos a lot. Tommy knows I like to watch videos on YouTube, you know, of craftsmen. I love to watch. It's how you learn, folks. I love to watch a wood worker, you know, a furniture maker, taking pieces of wood and turning it into something beautiful. But you know, every time I watch one of these guys working on stuff, every time I keep seeing processes 
and more processes and more processes that I would have never guessed were necessary to creating the final product. And you know what else happens? A lot of times while they're working on a project, something will happen, something will come along, and they'll say, well, I didn't think I was going to need to do this thing here, but as it turns out, this wood has this feature, or it has this, so I have to add a process. I have to do something additional. I have to do something I wasn't necessarily planning on doing, or maybe I've got to do it a different way. Do you follow what I'm saying now? But you see, a true craftsman is never in a hurry. If he has to do another process, if he has to add more uh, to the process of what he is doing, he simply adds it because his ultimate goal is a high quality, valuable product. If he didn't care about the quality, he could just rush through he could just say, well, if I wanted it to come out really, really, really good, then I would do, I would do this and I'd go ahead. I wouldn't plan on doing this, but I would do that just because it really kind of needs it. And, you know. But if he didn't care about the quality, he'd just rush through and do only what was uh, the bare minimum necessary. There's a reason why the furniture you buy at Walmart doesn't cost as much as the furniture you buy at Macy's or Dillard's, folks. I enjoy observing the processes necessary to creating a beautiful piece of furniture or a lovely structure. But I'm telling you, as I watch these videos, I often learn that there are dozens of steps in the process of creating that I would not otherwise have known. But true craftsmen take their time. They're not afraid to add yet another step to their process if in the end it means the finished product will be that much more functional or that much more beautiful are that much more valuable. A true craftsman honors the process. He does not try to finish the wood before he has sanded it or assemble the pieces before he has first completed the process necessary to the successful completion of each piece. A craftsman is given to details, no matter how minute. His reputation, listen to me children, his reputation rests upon every product he produces. And therefore, he strives to make certain that only the best quality product emerges from his workshop. Hebrews 6, 12 through 15. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith, listen, and patience inherit the promises. <laughs> For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. You see, Abraham honored the process. Hallelujah. Oh, you can't possibly inherit the promises unless you first learn faith and patience. I told Tommy on our way to church today, I said this is going to be one of the messages where the preacher is preaching to himself. So while I'm preaching in the spirit, my head is kind of kicking me up the backside of my head, you know, reminding me, see, this is for you preacher, this is for you. 
James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. Listen, that ye may be perfect and entire, meaning complete, wanting nothing. Gotta trust the process. Gotta let the craftsman do what the craftsman's doing. Don't rush him. Don't beg and plead with him. Certainly don't get ahead of him. That's where most believers mess up. Not only do they not trust him, not only do they not yield to him, not only do they not have patience and trust the process, but they rush ahead of God and they start doing things on their own that the Lord has been holding back. Luke chapter 21 verse 19, the word of the Lord declares, In your patience possess ye your souls. Romans chapter 9, verses 17 through 21. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. The potter decides whether he's going to take a lump of clay and turn it into a bedpan. Oh my Lord have mercy. Or a cooking pot. Am I telling the truth? St. Clay, but he decides whether it's going to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. The problem is we got a bunch of foolish Christians who love to run ahead of God, try to do things because they think they're ready. They think they deserve. They think they're in a position to possess something they're not yet ready for or God would have given it to you. And you know what winds up happening, Booby? They wind up a bedpan instead of something more honorable. How many Christians do you know that when you look at their life, you think to yourself, if that is what a Christian looks like, if that is what the Christian life looks like, I'm not sure I would choose that. They're always griping, they're always grumpy, they're always complaining, they're always miserable, they're always in a bad position, they're always struggling. Am I telling the truth? God help me, Jesus, I've lived this. I grew up in a family of folks who did this. I learned the I learned by example, to be honest with you. I, I had parents, I had mother, I had family that this is how they did things. Fight with God, argue with God, go get ahead of God, go try to have something you're not yet ready to have. Always pleading with God, I need a better job, I need more money. And the Lord keeps saying, you need wisdom for God's sake, you need wisdom. If any man lack of wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally. Come on now, why in the world don't you realize at the top of your shopping list ought not to be cars or jewelry or fancy clothes or a nice house. At the top of your prayer list ought to be wisdom. Wisdom will prepare you for so many things that until you get wisdom, you're not ready for the rest of it. You're not ready for that promotion at work. 
You're not ready for that race. You're not ready for a new position. You're not ready for that house. You're not ready for that car because you still lack wisdom. And without wisdom, you're going to get in that house and wind up being foreclosed on. Without wisdom, you're going to get that car and wind up having it repossessed. Oh my God, have mercy. I know I'm telling the truth today. How many of us in our younger years have been there? I'm not going to say raise your hands because the only person in this whole auditorium you can see today is me. And I'd be having my hand way up in the air. So I'm going, to I'm going to preserve my dignity and not ask people to raise their hands. But how many of us, Tommy, in our younger days when we lack wisdom, when we didn't know how to handle money, when we didn't know how to handle credit, when we didn't know how to do things the way they ought to be done, when we didn't have our priorities yet right. How many of us have had cars picked up by a tow truck and dragged off to a lot because we missed payments? My Lord have mercy. See, this preacher doesn't preach some idealistic la la message. I preach reality. People say, uh, you know, uh, well, how your church, bless God, you don't preach that there's supposed to be one father and one mother and two children and blah, blah, blah. And that's the design God gave. No, I sure don't, because guess what? That isn't what our world looks like. And I've got news for you. God didn't send me out to preach some ideal that 99.9% .9 of people don't live. He sent me to help the people who are living where they're living. And that's what I'm preaching today. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through in the word of the Lord said for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast listen to verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how many Christians run around and every desire they have has to do with consuming upon their own lusts, you know. It's all about them. It's all about their prestige and their image. I want to drive this kind of car. I want to wear these kind of clothes. I want to live in this kind of house, in this kind of a neighborhood. It's all about them. Yet the Word of God said we are His workmanship and that we have been uh, designed to perform good works. Not to live high and low. It doesn't say you've been designed to live like a king. That's how it said. said you've been designed to good works, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Isn't it funny how people, oh, they're praying, Lord, I need more money. I need a better job. I need a promotion. I need a raise. Why? Oh, so I can have, so I can have, so I can have. Are these the kind of people who help folks when they're in need? Are these the kind of people who constantly are exercising compassion, constantly being uh, charitable and helpful to folks who are suffering and struggling? No. I, knew, I know people in my own family as selfish as you ever could imagine in your entire life. I mean selfish to a point of vulgarity. Literally. But they claim to be Holy Ghost filled, Spirit filled Christian people. Oh, but when they're doing a collection at work for a lady who's having a baby, 
I didn't give them nothing. They don't take no collection for me. Why should I give them a collection for them? Somebody's out sick, so folks are donating a couple hours of their sick time to help that person, you know, be able to stay out of work with a web. That's God. I have to deal with it when I'm sick. Let them deal with it when they're sick. America is full of people, nearly half our population. Their whole mentality is, I don't give a thing about the next person. I had to struggle to get where I'm at. Let them struggle. I had to work hard to get where I'm at. Let them work hard. God forbid we try to make it easier for the next person. You would think after your struggle, after all the difficulty you went through, you would think you would have more compassion. You would think you'd have more empathy. You'd realize, you know, man, I had to hold down a job while I was trying to go to school and college uh, cost so much and man, I struggled and struggled and struggled, but I got through college. But it sure wasn't easy. I'll tell you what, Tommy, if I can make it easier on the next guy, I'm happy to do that. But my problem is, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I, my problem is, my problem is that I am His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I can't help but want to do good things. I can't help but want to help other people. I can't help but want to be a blessing and be charitable. I can't help it. It's in me to do that. Why? Because that is what God has created me to do. Hello now, children. Mm-hmm. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art the Father, our Father. We are the clay, and Thou our potter. And we all are the work of Thy hand. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father, or even Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Peter said sometimes during the process, there's some stuff we're just going to have to wait on till we get to glory. He said, I'll tell you, there, you know, I hate sometimes to have to go into my own personal life experience. You know, if people think I enjoy talking about certain things, they, they don't know how wrong they are. But I grew up under a narcissistic father who never had a good word to say about nothing. I could not do, my brothers and I, it wasn't just me, my brothers and I, all three of us, we could never do anything make him happy. Not a thing in this world. And, and that is not hyperbole, folks. I mean it. 
uh, if you talk to my uncles, my aunts, my grandparents, every one of them would tell you that I am not joking. If I mowed the lawn, I mowed it wrong. I didn't do it the way he wanted it done. He gripe and groan about uh, where I left the grass clippings. He gripe and groan about the pattern I followed in mowing the lawn. I mean, you know, there was always something, but he always found fault. Unfortunately, I've explained this to Tommy over the years, you, you do that to your kid. I'm going to tell you, don't let me see you do that to your kid because I'll slap you upside your head. You think I'm joking? Try me. I hate that foolishness. I can't stand people raising their children that way. What a hideous, horrible, painful, miserable way to raise your children. Constantly finding fault. Constantly criticizing I'm 58 years old. I've been hardwired so that people can barely even compliment me and I hear criticism. Do you know how hard it is to go through your life and, and you just can't hardly even hear a positive word spoken to you about anything? When people say it, kind of goes right over your head, you know. I don't get puffed up in vain over it because I don't believe it. <laughs> so at least I don't have to worry about getting vain when people s say positive things. But you know what? I grew up with constant criticism. I grew up with somebody who was supposed to love me and care about me. Somebody who was supposed to nurture me and contribute to my positive growth and development. Constantly tearing me down. Constantly finding fault. Constantly criticizing. I've told Tommy sometimes, I said, Honest to God, I feel like I'm never ever going to be in a place where people are going to say, kind things to me. The Lord's put me in a ministry where I've, I'm constantly under attack. I'm constantly being attacked. Not just by people who can't stand LGBT people, but oh glory me, I get the added luxury of being hated and despised and talked down to and criticized and ridiculed by LGBT people too. I've told Tommy many times, I said, I don't know why the Lord called me to do what I'm doing because I'm the wrong guy for this job. I am the wrong person for this job. If there's anybody in this world who cannot handle constant negativity, constant criticism, constant, you know, garbage being thrown at them, that's me. I can't handle it. I do not respond well to it. The difference between me and a lot of people is I can tell you that that's what it is. A lot of people, they, they can't even acknowledge that they're like that, you know. But I'll tell you, I know it's true. I know it is. I've, I've had, had enough experience in life that I've learned. I've spent some time on the couch with a psychologist so I could try to deal with my issues. Yes, I have. Some of you listen to me today. You need to do the same thing. Wouldn't hurt you. Learn about yourself. Be a little introspective. Look inside. Figure out why you do things the way you do things. Wouldn't kill you to do that, folks. There's a lot of people out there that would benefit from that. I've done it. I didn't do it because my parents sent me somewhere. I was an adult. I chose to do it for my own self. But there are many times I feel like, I said, I'll tell you what, I've, you know, I've begged people online, I said, folks, I really appreciate, you cannot know how much it means to me after a service when people will just post a little comment, a little encouragement, a little word, say I enjoyed the service or that message blessed me or whatever. I don't care what you say. I'm not asking people to do that because I'm, I'm self, you know, exalting or whatever. No, 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 no. I'm asking because 
I get discouraged real easy. I get depressed real easy. I struggle to do what I'm doing. And I really appreciate people offering some positive feedback and some kind words. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been begging people, begging people, begging people, begging people. And you know what? 98% of the time, I don't get one word from anybody. I can beg and beg and beg. Doesn't matter. Can't get people to do it for nothing in the world. So I have to do what I'm doing without any encouragement. I have to do what I'm doing without anybody saying anything that helps me to know that I'm being helpful, that I'm being a blessing, that I'm being an encouragement, that my ministry is helping somebody. I just have to keep going, keep going, keep going, not getting any feedback, not getting any encouragement, not getting any positive words. But I have to learn patience. I have to believe that this is the gold going through the fire. And that one day, when my Jesus comes, I'm finally, finally, going to hear somebody say, Well done. Because there's some things that frankly you're never going to get in this life. Never going to happen. And if you keep griping and groaning over it, honey, you're just wasting your breath. You're just wasting your effort. It's not going to happen. But Peter said, we look forward to the day when we'll finally be able to have what we never seem to be able to get. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? In this life. Job chapter 23 and 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Oh, people of God, I want you to hear me today. Nothing produced by a craftsman is made without pain or struggle. If it were easy, anyone could do it. There'd be no premium paid for the work of an expert, an artist, or the experience of a seasoned master. But boy, if you're going to buy something made by a craftsman, a real true craftsman, you're going to pay for it. It's going to be expensive. It's going to cost something. Why? Because, honey, it's not just the materials he uses, but it's also the process that he has to go through to take that piece of wood and make it into furniture, to take that lumber and make it into that house or that building or that structure. Almost done today. Philippians 1 and 6. The word of the Lord tells us being confident of this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Those who call themselves Christians who are foolish enough to believe that they've attained that they've reached perfection, that they've gotten to the heights of heights of absolute perfection. They're everything God wants for them. Got news for you, honey. Mm -mm. Paul told the Philippians, God ain't going to be finished working on you right up till rapture. Hello now. The Lord ain't going to be finished working on you right up till the day you die. He'll be working on you. Why? Because you ain't never going to be what he wants you to be until post-rapture. You're never going to be what he wants you to be until post-resurrection. He's working on us every day in every way. We have to learn to trust the process. I think of Moses raised in Pharaoh's palace raised as an Egyptian son 
all his life being waited on, probably didn't have to even lift up the weight of his own coat or his own clothes because he had somebody there to help dress him. You know, those of us that like uh, Downton Abbey, you remember those aristocrats in England, and uh, you know, they, they had somebody to help put their clothes on, for heaven's sakes. My Lord, they didn't even have to lift their own jacket or tie their own tie because there was somebody there to help them do even the most menial of tests. This is how Moses was raised. Then at the age of 40, he gets himself into some trouble. He winds up having to run off into the desert to hide because now he's a wanted man. And for 40 years, 40 years, a man who was raised in Pharaoh's palace, listen, is relegated to tending sheep. Think about it. Oh, all those soft, feathery cushions he sat on in Pharaoh's house, now he's sitting on rocks. All that fancy furniture he got to enjoy in Pharaoh's house, now he's having to sit himself down on logs and pieces of wood. All the aristocrats, all the fanciest of people in Pharaoh's kingdom that he used to rub noses with. And now he's alone all day out in the field with a bunch of smelly old sheep. I love my dogs. I love my dogs more than I love almost anything in this world. But Tommy will tell you. He comes home from work and I'm talking a blue streak because I've been home all day. All I've had is the dogs. He's been at work. He's able to talk to human beings. He's able to interact with human beings. He's able to joke. He's able to laugh. He's able to do all kinds of stuff with human beings. I'm at home all day. I've got two dogs. As much as I love them, it's not the same. Imagine Pharaoh. Imagine, uh, excuse me, imagine Moses growing up in Pharaoh's house 40 years. Man, that's a long time to get used to something. I've often said one of the worst things about my ministry I've come to realize is that in the first phase of my ministry, I was extremely successful. Man, I mean to tell you, the Church of God thought I was something special. I had a, a, an overseer in the Church of God who told me that one day he said, Brother, you're going to be preaching camp meetings. You're going to be preaching camp meetings one day. And that was my overseer telling me. It'd be one thing if it was just another preacher, but that was my overseer telling me that. Church of God only used the cream of the crop to preach cat meetings. You had to really have a ministry to preach cat meetings. And my overseer was telling me that he saw me as having a ministry, you know, that one day would be preaching cat meetings. Man, I'll tell you, my early days, our church grew. My God, I told Tommy the other day, I said, uh, I, in my first church, I don't think I remember a Sunday we didn't have at least one or two visitors in the church. And I guarantee you that for every 10 visitors we had, eight of them stayed. I guarantee it. Same thing was true in my second church. Same thing was true in my third church. Then all of a sudden, everything changes. So all of a sudden, I'm no longer in Pharaoh's house. All of a sudden now, I'm out in the field tending sheep. All of a sudden, God puts me in a ministry where I'm trying to help and minister to people who have been ostracized and criticized and set aside and mistreated and abused. And all they want to do is buck me. All they want to do is fight with me. All they want to do is accuse me. All they want to do is give me grief. I'm tending sheep. I'm going to tell you something, honey. I understand what, what Moses has went through. <laughs> Going from Pharaoh's house to tending sheep. But sometimes that's 
how the process works. But you know, as difficult as the second 40 years of Moses' life may have seemed, there were lessons he was learning in caring for sheep. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Mm. There were lessons he learned in caring for sheep <laughs> that were going to help him through the third 40 years because God was going to make him shepherd over Israel. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And sometimes, while the majority of the sheep may follow the shepherd, there's always going to be those that want to go off in their own direction. And the shepherd got to go chase them down. He's got to chastise them. He's got to get them back in the fold. And Moses went through that over and over and over and over again between the age of 80 and him dying at 120. But you got to trust the process. Moses could never have led God's people out of Egypt if he had tried to do so at 40 having only known the pleasures of Pharaoh's house now he had to learn how rough and uncomfortable and miserable it is out in the wilderness with a bunch of sheep if he was going to do what God had ordained for him to do. God set Moses up to be one of the greatest men in all of Judaism. He knew one life for 40 years. He knew another life for another 40 years. But the first 40 would not have prepared him for the third set of 40. But the second 40 did. Folks, whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whatever, you're feeling like God needs to put a rush on it. It's like, Lord, why in the world don't you get me out of this struggle? Why don't you get me out of this mess? He's preparing you for something. He's preparing you for your next round. He's preparing you for your next level. Don't rush it. Don't lose your patience. The preacher's preaching to the preacher, I promise you. Don't lose your patience. You got to finish out this 40 because he's got 40 years planned for you that you cannot accomplish until you have gone through this 40. My Lord have mercy. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The last thing I want to share with you this afternoon in closing. Revelation 22, 1 through 4. I may run the aisles at this one. I may shout a little at this one. 22 verses 1 through 4, Revelation. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. One throne, but it's the throne of God and of the Lamb, or even of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the, tr the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants, notice that said their servants, His servants 
shall serve him. Who's him? God and the Lamb. Because God and the Lamb are one. And they shall see his face. Oh, but listen to this, children. And his name, oh, glory, shall be on their foreheads. <laughs> you know why? Because a craftsman always signs his work. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. When we finally get where we're going, when we finally become everything that God designed us to become, that He desired us to become, everything that God has wanted for us to be from the beginning of time, when He finally completes His work in us, the Word of God, we shall see Him as He is, for we shall be like Him. And in Revelation 22 it said, And they shall see his face. How? Why? Because we shall be like him. Glory to God. The work will be finished. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Because the craftsman always signs his work. The sign of a craftsman. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah.